just wanted to say, Shadi, before you popped on, uh, Bruno was on for a bit, and I feel really bad because he uh, he actually watched the 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 Biden speech uh, in order just for the podcast, and I didn't I didn't watch it. <laughs> well, I I only watched a few like uh, ten minutes of it or so, and I wasn't fully focusing. Um, and maybe our listeners won't appreciate that. I mean, it is a very important moment, so I feel a little bit sheepish about not being fully invested. I just had work to do. I mean, but, I think I think it's 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 important to note. Like, we're recording literally one hour into the Biden presidency. It's one o'clock on Wednesday, um, in Washington D.C. Eastern Time. So that's uh, that's that's yeah. And I've so so is it real? Like, so I, I it hasn't really dawned on me, and maybe. So it, it's actually true. It's true. It's happening. Bruno? So Joe Biden is quite literally our president this instant as we speak. Bruno, is it happening? I mean, you watched the speech. <laughs> uh, that's right. I I think it is. I and I'm surprised it doesn't feel different for yeah. for you guys in DC. It doesn't. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, Bruno. You know, the interesting thing is, so, so I've I've spent the last two months in Croatia. I came back on Friday, um, and I've been, uh, you know. I, I watched in disbelief uh, the the spectacle on January sixth as the 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 mob stormed the Capitol, um, in real disbelief. And then have been watching on the news the the build up and the twenty thousand troops, twenty five thousand troops, thirty thousand troops, more than Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq combined, all in Washington D.C. So I come back, and let me tell you, it's weird. It's very weird here because uh, there are checkpoints like three deep to go into to even get to the mall. You can't even get to the mall, but, you know, there's barricades everywhere. But I was more struck by the fact that that, in fact, it wasn't that different from when I left right after the elections, because, you know, leading up to the elections, you had all the protests. Uh, Washington, D.C. is completely boarded up, still is. Um, and, and I remember during during um, during the the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, we had National Guard on the street at one point. I mean, this was around the time when Trump was doing his, uh, you know, when he, he got the police to set up that entire spectacle about him going to the church and cleared the crowds and everything. But, you know, either the night before that or the night after, there were National Guard troops on the streets. And in fact, they seemed more armed and, and it, a more dangerous sort of feeling. It's actually, it's been, it's felt pretty relaxed overall, uh, my, my impression coming back here. But but also, I think it's a question, and this gets at, I think, a lot of Bruno's work, um, what's real and what's not? Can we trust our own feelings? So, um, you know, and, and I'm starting to doubt my connection with the reality in the <laughs> sense that we're living during a, a pandemic, so I don't actually go into much of D.C. So I live in the city, but I'm very removed from where the inauguration is happening and it would be very difficult for me to come close, obviously. Um, and, you know, I don't, uh, I, you know, I don't see people in real life as much as I used to. And much of our lives are now lived virtually. So there's a kind of distance to what's happening um, at the inauguration right now. Um, but also, I think. I'm I'm relieved, and I think this is a big difference between how I felt four years ago when Trump was inaugurated compared to today. That that felt like a very um, historic moment, in part because it was so frightening. What I feel now is more a sense of relief, and I hope it gives me permission to care less about the day-to-day -day developments of American politics. I mean, I've I've been longing to move beyond Trump. And I'm, I'm sure Trump will find a way to be in our minds and consume us, uh, but I hope not. And I, and I think that this is the time for us to start moving away. Anyway, there's, there's a lot for us to go into. Um, and then, you know, uh, Demir will introduce our guest. I guess you guys can probably tell that we have a third person with us. But before that, and before we unveil who our special guest is, you might have guessed by his first name, just a couple housekeeping things. Um, we will be recording a bonus episode afterwards for subscribers only. And we also have quite a bit of members only content that's come out recently. I had a new piece on whether the whole fascism debate actually matters. Um, Demir had something about Kissinger. If you want to read all that and listen to our bonus episode, become a subscriber. Go to wisdomofcrowds.live slash subscribe. 
and pay us a little amount of money to get this very special extra content. And with that, uh, Demir. Yeah, Bruto, welcome. Uh, Bruto, how do you say your last name? It's Machias, right? Massage. Massage. A, a little softer. A little softer. Massage. Okay, excellent. Uh, Bruno, uh, welcome. You are, I've known, I guess we've corresponded, I think since 2018 is the first time you published uh, at the American Interest, which was around the time your first book came out, right? That's right. So my writing career is essentially three years old. Three years old. Oh. And you are, yeah. I mean, three years old and, and, uh, and three really excellent books already under your under your your belt you're you're, you're incredibly prolific i'm trying to to keep the pace of a book a year mm. let's see if it's going to wow. be possible yeah shoddy's um, writing a book now <laughs> <laughs> take take heart shoddy yeah go on bruno uh i i think it uh I'm curious about about what, what shoddy's book is uh but uh you know i i i've discovered that it helps you keep a certain discipline um which i didn't have before Hmm. not postponing your thinking or, or putting it to writing and uh, helping you. So without a book on the pandemic, for example, you know, I'd have some random thoughts about it, but I want to reach a kind of at least some general understanding of what happened over the past year and how to interpret it. And I just um, concluded that the way to do it is, is to write a book, uh, even if it's not a, a, a masterpiece or a definitive book on it. Have you, did you, did you pivot from, uh, government work straight to writing or was there a period in between where you were doing other things how, how, what's your career arc i mean i know you were you were a minister in the portuguese government and and uh tell us a little bit about that right so then uh, we lost the election and uh I, I had nothing to do you know in part because you're not supposed to be looking for a job while you're still in office and, mm -hmm. and then it's a sort of a political crisis overnight you're you're out of there we, we lost an election couldn't form a majority uh, and then actually i left on a on a very long uh, trip um through Central Asia, through China, Russia, Caucasus, uh, took me six months. And there was some thought of writing a book, but actually not not very firm. Uh, I had no contacts in um, in publishing houses uh, and wrote a couple of pieces and there seemed to be interest. And then the book came out pretty well around the idea of the trip. Hmm. And so that was the first book that came out uh, beginning of, of 2018. But I spent uh, six months alone traveling from... Uh, the uh, Caspian to China and back to the Caspian. And and uh, you, you write about that also in the second book. So th that first book's called The Dawn yeah. of Eurasia, right? And then the second mm -hmm. book, Belt and Road, when you're describing, I mean, it's also very much a travelogue. Or am I confusing those two? Uh, it has a little bit of it, but it's more, it, it's it's more, it, it's in a way, you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't say this. You can't pick between books I found out because, you know, sometimes they have different publishers and, and the publishers don't like that. <laughs> but uh, it's a less exciting book. It's just a sort of a, explanation analysis of what the Belt and Road is. Uh, but it does have a, quite a bit of political philosophy, which I think is not common in a book on, on Belt and Road or, or Chinese uh, politics or Chinese foreign policy to include some uh, good amount of 30 pages on, on political philosophy. Let's not forget but, that um, books, books are like children. You have to love them all? <laughs> Maybe not equally, but you're supposed to love them. <laughs> Right. Uh, I don't think that's true, actually. I've, I've come to realize that often it's just because you can't do it contractually. <laughs> well, you, you're supposed to love your children also, not contractually, but I guess legally. I mean, uh, you're, you're punished yeah. if you abandon your children. Um, anyway, so, but the, the, the new book, I think, is, is where we'll spend a lot of our time uh, today uh, discussing, Bruno, because I, I feel like you've been also, uh, you have a successful new Substack as well, and, and you've been I think the, the book came out, uh, it's called uh, History Has Begun, uh, The Birth of a New America, has a lot of political philosophy in it as well. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine a, a, um, a better time to be discussing this book than right in the aftermath of, of January 6th, and, and even more so right in the, on the cusp of, of, uh, of, uh, of the, the rising of Biden. So, I mean, you know, one of the things that, that's really striking about the book and a lot of, of your writing is what Shadi was alluding to earlier is this, is this, this question of, of reality. And uh, it seems like mm -hmm. one of the theses that I think you, you really explore in here is that, you know, it's, well, I mean, is it fair to say that America sort of uh, is, we like to think of it in terms of, of these sort of categories of, you know, the West and, and uh, uh categories of, of liberalism and democracy, but in many ways, you see America as a, as a reality factory of sorts, right? Right. Uh, America has succeeded in abolishing reality, which in a way has been a goal since um, 
since humanity has been around. Um, the whole idea of fantasy of dreams uh, is is that aspiration. Uh, and so my thesis, which is still a work in progress, I think this book needs a companion volume of some kind in the future, or perhaps a second edition, much expanded. But it's my first attempt to look at America as a project to abolish reality. Fits our dovetails rather nicely with the Enlightenment because there was already a little bit of that in the Enlightenment in political philosophy categories. But of course, the Enlightenment was was very ambiguous on this because at the same time that it wanted human freedom to be free of limits, it also had this strong scientific element uh, uh, that was part of it and that appealed to uh, uh, irreducible realm of facts and truth, as uh, um, the new president said today. Uh, the center of his speech was truth won. And truth is back. Uh, so this is um, still a, a very ambiguous message because at the same time that we want to appeal to truth, uh, we also feel that truth is a limit or truth is rather subjective. Uh, very difficult to know exactly how you can build a polity on the basis of truth. I think Chadi is, has been writing some things that I've seen also around these concerns, although I guess he wouldn't be as radical as I am. Uh, but uh, very difficult to, to do that. And uh, I think uh, probably... In possible in our historical moment to, to do something like that. America has tried the opposite, to build a polity on, on reality, on fantasy, on dreams. Uh, and let's see if it works. Um, and let's see, by the way, if the project continues, uh, because one way to interpret Biden is uh, America as a country has recoiled from that project. Um, back to truth, I, I guess would be the title of the speech today. Well, I think there's, um, Bruno, a, a tension in your, in your book, which let me just say, I highly recommend it to our listeners to to get a copy and hopefully buy a copy because um you know a lot of books these days aren't particularly original they kind of especially during the trump era where there was a lot of um, rehashing of things this is a truly i think um original book with an original thesis it's also a very challenging thesis and, and one that i felt a little bit torn about and i'm curious Bruno, I mean, at the end of the book, I think the final chapter, you have a sentence that that I think really stands out, um, and you sort of alluded to this already, perhaps alone among all contemporary civilizations, America regards reality as an enemy to be defeated. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, but in your book, I think you get at there, are, that can be good, it can also be b bad. We know how this can be bad, because if you're always thinking about fantasy and if you're not willing to accommodate yourself to reality that can lead to problems um and there's any number of examples that we could point to but i think there's sort of this silver lining of optimism and i think you go back and forth a little bit um but there is something good that america is distinctive in this regard and that mm -hmm. is actually an engine of creativity and of boldness and innovation is that sometimes we as Americans, when we see reality, we don't accept it, we try to transcend it. And that uh, that can uh, uh, lead to progress and a kind of a drive for something more. And I think that maybe the vaccine is one example of this. I mean, if we had only, if we had left it to the EU countries to develop a vaccine, they probably would have, um, been even more delayed than they already were but the us and of course also britain and that's maybe a little bit of a different case you know operation warp speed was a suggestion that the us didn't feel bound by normal constraints when it came to thinking about how to combat the virus in terms of um, coming up with a vaccine so maybe just unpack that a little bit for us how how much of this fantasy is good and how much of it is bad and how much of it is distinctly American? Mm -hmm. Well, in the book, you, you know, you have to take the project to its to its natural conclusion. Uh, and so in the book, I uh, I try not to be ambiguous or undecided about it. Uh, uh, the book is um, clearly on the side of fantasy as a more salutary form of politics and clearly on the side of America as representing this in a way that no one else can. Um, that's created problems for me in the months since the book came out because, you know, people, readers, even uh, just readers writing to you, giving you some feedback, they point to a similar phenomenon in Brazil or a similar phenomenon in France. And I'm uh, always trying to insist that in, in its purity, what I'm talking about in the book, you can find only in America. Now, what are the advantages since I 
I, I clearly defend the idea as being very salutary. On the one hand, what you talk about, um, innovation, fantasy, dreaming about Mars, uh, and in fact, creating this internet that we have that is not only new, but is fundamentally defined by fantasy. I think if the internet had been developed, not in Silicon Valley, but in Berlin or in Beijing, we'd have a completely different uh, creature. Um, so it, it does have that advantage. It has a second advantage that's perhaps more difficult to see. Uh, it is actually prudential in a certain way because it prevents you from accepting certain political theories as the truth. So I, I really take issue with, for example, this latest essay by Timothy Snyder that I didn't read, but I already take take issue with it. Uh, but I, I didn't read because I knew it would upset me. Um, that uh, that this is about uh, that America is post truth uh, and that's fascism uh, because I've read quite a bit on both fascism and uh, Soviet communism and there's nothing of the sort there. Uh, what do you find there, even in Hitler's table talk uh, everywhere, is truth being defended uh, against liberal relativism and now we have the truth uh, about race and about racial history and about the outcome of the struggle between races or about historical forces in the case of. Uh, Soviet communism. So at least this is an open question. Uh, and I think in the case of the current situation in America, clearly the fact that people could just not go along with Trump anymore uh, when it seemed that he had started to actually believe in all that stuff and the people around him. You see McConnell just saying, well, this is, uh, yeah, this was fun, but I'll, I'll stop here. Um, because by the way, if we go back to January 6th, uh, what was the problem? Is that those people lost touch with reality or actually uh, that the problem was when they started to think that um, those fantasies were real, uh, that in fact they embraced reality in some form. And I think, you know, this is a conceptual point uh, more than a, an empirical one, but I think it's important because if, if all these uh, fantasies and Trump and others, the woke left and so on have been propagating, if they stay at the level of fiction uh, and if there's a certain awareness that they are fiction, then many of the problems disappear, right? The problems don't arise from the fact that they are fiction. The problems arise when their followers and, and also other, sometimes their opponents start to take them as the truth. And the, the drive to impose them on everyone else is the, the drive to regard them as truth that has to be valid for everyone. So, but if I, you, yeah, you know, I, that's a really excellent stuff there. Um, the, 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 the question is, though, right, is... is, is and I think this is the moment right now, and from what I've seen, you know, briefly looking at, at some of the reactions to the, the Biden speech is, is again, trying to reground politics in this essence, this question of truth. And there's, there's that, that gets at the, the tension, I think, at what you're saying, um, is that, I, I mean, would you say that, that, that it's productive and it's possible to, to, to keep a politics in this sort of liminal space between ultimate truth and not because you know you're saying the, the 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 question about what happened on january 6th when these people showed up i don't know if you saw um the uh pro publica actually went through the that that uh you know that that chat program parlor and and found all of the the videos and one of their or se several of their journalists watched all of them and then they wrote a a, a nice essay sort of uh summarizing what you know this this incredible moment which is now captured from a thousand different perspectives on the ground and the sort of <clears throat> i mean it in in one way to describe it it's 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 these people coming into contact with a certain kind of opposite reality and the sense of wonder and you know you're you're you you've just sort of laid that out to a certain extent it's like were these people you know checked to a certain extent by reality but the 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 what comes out of january 6 is still not clear to me that that you know that a limit was necessarily reached or that you know a certain kind of circumspection is coming back into this it's well or is it i don't know you tell me what do you think have we have has has there going to be a snapback to something or are we talking about maybe a new kind of fantasy being now born and and sort of, you know, th these questions of polarization and, and these things that are tearing at American politics not being resolved at all and remaining unresolvable. I don't know. How do you, how do you, how do you pick right. at that? No, I, I don't think there's going to be a snapback. Uh, I, I think you're going to continue to live in, in dreamland, in fantasy land, in, in some sense. Um, now, what, what is Biden going to do? Uh, he could... Uh, embrace some of the ideas on the left. I don't think he's going to do that. 
he could create a fantasy politics of his own. Uh, so I have a piece that's going to come out in, in a couple of weeks where I try to make their argument successfully or unsu unsuccessfully, we'll see. But there's a, there's a strong element of fantasy in Biden as well. Uh, and the way I see it playing out is he'll be tempted to present current situation as, in a way, having, having, having been resolved. Uh, America is what it's always been. Um, the global liberal order is in good shape again. Uh, everything is perfect. We live in the best of all possible worlds. Uh, there's a great temptation, temptation in Biden to do this. Uh, so you could, in fact, present the world as it is, not really modified since Trump left, as already uh, being um, having reached its, its full and, and perfect development. Uh, this is going to be dangerous, particularly in foreign policy, uh, where I think we're now entering the moment where the so-called liberal international order is going to become an object of fantasy. Uh, because in previous decades, it had its own um, uh, weaknesses, vulnerabilities, uh, but it was something real. Uh, now I think uh, with Obama, we saw a bit of that, and I think with Biden, we're gonna see more of it. So you could in fact uh, uh, try to make the argument that China uh, has agreed on climate targets, and therefore China is someone we can work with, and on human rights it can't, but therefore it's gonna be ostracized, everything is working, uh, the, the liberal order is back. I think that's going to be his temptation, but that's a, a form of fantasy politics just as powerful as uh, as Trump's, uh, it, just in the opposite direction. I make the comparison between, you know, if Trump was, a, uh, there are many fantasies, and if Trump was a form of fantasy rooted in extreme freedom, uh, in uh, lack of limits, uh, not having to follow political correctness or good manners, uh, Biden is a sort of a romantic comedy equivalent of that, where the world is already reconciled, is perfect, where kindness and honesty rule. But if you turn on the TV, you find uh, television shows that are the kind of Trumpian fantasy, and you find television shows that are the Biden fantasy. They, they're both uh, fantasy. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I just, uh, you know, I'm curious what, what you guys think, but I just don't see what it means, even conceptual to say that we're back to reality. What is that? And what is that in America in particular? So I was struck in Biden's speech, how much he talked about unity. And personally, I'm not the biggest fan of unity because that presumes some level of conformity. And I think that a pluralistic society has to co accommodate competing conceptions of the good. And it's okay for Americans to disagree about foundational questions as long as they do so peacefully and legally and all that. So I think there's, from my standpoint, there was a bit of fantasy and it felt surreal to me to hear after four years of intense division and polarization that Biden is treating the last four years as an aberration and that we are going to return to this fantasy of unity. But I guess, Bruno, like this is where I struggle with it a little bit, because can we really separate reality from fantasy? I mean, so much of life and therefore so much about politics is about aspiring towards things that aren't actually present in the real world. I mean, is that can we sort of draw this dividing line and treat it as discrete categories here. And I think what we saw with January 6th is that we can talk about dream politic all we want and treat it as if it's a fantasy, but inevitably it starts to infringe on the real world. So I think a lot, I mean, certainly I think one thing that I got wrong is I thought that dream politic would stay in the dream world. And I think this was also Ross Douthat's argument in his columns about this. And I think dream politic was originally coined by um, Joan Didion uh, several decades ago. Um, but uh, we can't insulate ourselves from fantasy because there's going to be a small number of people, even if it's um, in the US, who decide to take matters into their own hands and make the fantasy into something real, right? Well, but, but but you know, I think I'm a bit more radical than you are on this, and I've I've exchanged a few messages with Ross about this at all. I would insist that the original thesis is still 100% valid. Uh, what happened on January 6th was a, a kind of fantasy crashed and was revealed as just a fantasy for uh, those uh, 
uh, for the crowd entering the capital. But you didn't have in America, and I think here, uh, and you, you, you have this, uh, and Darmir has as well, uh, a certain historical and, and uh, experience of what uh, political conflict really is. We didn't have that in America. Uh, we didn't have a political crisis similar to uh, a regime crisis in other countries. Uh, recently in 2016 in Turkey, and I was there and followed it closely. Uh, in fact, I would insist that you had a peaceful transition of power. I saw people on Twitter today mocking this idea. Well, what was it then? Uh, uh, and in fact, Trump didn't do any of the things that everyone was uh, certain he would do. Uh, the real serious stuff, the real stuff, uh, the Insurrection Act, uh, or trying to force states and uh, uh, get governors to overturn the results of the Electoral College. Uh, what he did was, you know, I'm perhaps as as not living in DC and and, and not being a, in any way an insider, I'm freer to say this. What we had was, to a considerable extent, theater, uh, and we had a moment where clearly the fantasy uh, lost control, and and the police work was was very deficient, uh, and there was all very tragic, and m even more than tragic, it was, I think, uh, painful for America's self understanding of itself, and it will take a long time to heal. Uh, but did we really have a coup without quotes? Uh, did we really have fascism without quotes? Uh, as you've been writing, uh, this is very, very dubious. Um, so I do think that uh, the Trumpian fantasy stayed for what really matters at the level of fantasy until the very end. And he left uh, peacefully entering the helicopter. Um, now you could argue there's nothing you could do. Uh, in fact, uh, it's not the last month that is relevant here. As Ross has pointed out very well, in my opinion, uh, he could have done something during the pandemic, uh, six, nine months ago, one year ago. Uh, he had both the time and the pretext and the opportunity, if that was really the game being played in the US, but it wasn't. Um, so I would, uh, in, in brief, I would, uh, I would encourage you and Ross to stick to the original guns that uh, <laughs> this really was dream politics to the end. I, you know, I, the thing that struck me, um, I, I, I just scribbled something that will go up later on the site uh, about uh, sort of American self-conception. You just brushed up against it. And it's it's really is, I think, a really why why I think your book is 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 good at getting something important about America is is this idea. And you're right. I think January 6th really was is still hard for Americans. And I count myself as an American. I, I've lived here my whole life, even though I, I only got citizenship, uh, I don't know how many years ago now. Um, it's it's difficult to really wrap our heads around because it, it, it hit at, at a certain kind of symbolic self-understanding. And I think it's going to take a long time to for us to recover from that or even to 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 internalize it but but you know to to take your your positive spin on it and and you know like i said i haven't listened to biden's speech but i imagine you know what what inauguration speeches are supposed to be is to appeal to this kind of uh, uh unreal idea of what it is to be an american and it's that unreality that that fantasy element that allows america to actually function Right. I mean, the, the piece right. that I just wrote right now is 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 <laughs> more Balkan European cynical in the sense that I'm, I'm pointing to the fact that that I'm I'm concerned that our that America's focus on we are Democrats, we do democracy and this is who we are and we believe in these values and these values are the main things that bind us together, that that's just not enough. It's not sufficient. It's not sufficient anywhere else in the world except perhaps here. And I was making the case that maybe January 6th shows that that right. there are fissures opening up in society that are not bridgeable by simple beliefs in liberal values or, or democratic values and, and in what, you know, Shadi likes to talk about as a sort of uh, minimalist commitment to democracy, right? That's, but that, but that, arguably, that, right, I mean, it's, it's the fact that America is able to constantly appeal to this thing, and presumably that's what Biden did in his speech, it's what, what keeps America going, right? I mean, that's that fantasy creation, right? right? No, I, I, I agree with you on that, you know, if you want to present Biden as as an element, an example of, of fantasy policy, it's not the rhetoric in speech, of course, which, uh, by the way, was was very traditional. We've seen it uh, over the decades uh, in, in very similar terms. Um, I would look to this very interesting question that Biden presents Trump, and this has been pointed out a lot, particularly at the beginning of the primaries, that Biden presented Trump as a existential threat to America. But then concluded in a very puzzling way, if you step back and look at it, that the only thing that was needed was to remove Trump from office. Uh, that you have, in fact, an existential threat to the republic, uh, gain power and be elected, 
and then it's just enough to switch off the television screen to make Trump disappear and everything is going to be perfect. That's what I mean by fantasy politics. And many people on the far left in the US and certainly most Europeans on the left, social Democrats, would think about this in very different terms. They would say, well, this is the symptom of uh, really serious problems with American society and the regime that have to be addressed in a bold transformational project, which is going to be very difficult and very dangerous, but there's no alternative. Uh, and some people, even during the primaries, at least uh, understood this logic. Biden never understood it. Uh, it was a criticism that he never really recognized, that he thought uh, this very dangerous moment for the Republic could be solved uh, uh, so superficially as it, as, uh, as it was. Uh, uh, and I think today in the speech, he still believes in that. Uh, so that doesn't really square with, for example, the European social democratic tradition, which is not interested in building a certain uh, narrative and a certain self-perception is interested in a project of social economic transformation. Now we'll see what happens with Biden. Maybe he'll find this. Some people are asking him to go and find these resources. I just don't see that happening at all. Hmm. So, I mean, yeah, so, tell me, tell me one, it's, it's just sort of an aside, but I, I found it really interesting. And maybe, maybe this also helps build on this. You, there's a, there's a, a bit in the piece where you talk about actually encountering John Rawls at one point, and uh, you don't, you don't actually quote your, your interaction uh, with him, but you said that Rawls was not impressed at the way you approached the question. I mean, you've written about this, I think, or maybe it was an interview I read of yours at City Journal, where you talked about Rawls and, and his sort of approach to liberalism and reality, um, and how, you know, you, you end up balancing uh, these sort of competing claims to, to well, to truth and, and all the rest of this. Uh, let's see if I have the quote right here. Um, said, I chose to ask him whether he thought a philosophical doctrine could have any reality if its defenders were supposed to apply it only to their own private convictions. In secret, you could be anything. In public, you had to be a liberal. And then you you, you say that he wasn't too happy about that. What, what was the, 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 the crux of Rawls's unhappiness? Uh, well, uh, this is kind of a, a, a sort of a tongue-in-cheek private joke passage because, uh, you know, you can imagine I, I must have been 20 years old. Uh, and, and John Rawls by then was not in the greatest shape. And he just, you know, politely uh, listened to me. But the, you guys must know this when you're 20 and you think you've solved all the problems of of political thought and you're just surprised that uh, uh, everyone else doesn't quite recognize it. So it's it's that kind of moment. Uh, but still, I think, uh, and, and, and Charlie has been writing a lot about this, uh, so I think you'll recognize the problem. You have in liberalism this project of making pretty much everything possible. Uh, you can be a devout Muslim, but you can also be a uh, um, bohemian, uh, hipster, intellectual, uh, and everything is possible. But it's only possible because it's been leveled off uh, and all these experiences lose meaning. Uh, and eventually they may even disappear as the European societies show. Uh, and that's fine in the sense that it provides safety, security um, to life and you don't run the dangers of actually ending up in a theocracy uh, or in a revolutionary republic. But, uh, but it's still not the end of history because the problem hasn't been solved. Uh, if you want to be a free, liberal, devout Muslim, the problem hasn't been solved by living in a society where you can perhaps be Muslim in your mind, in your consciousness, but not in real observance in the real world, uh, and certainly not in politics, uh, which matters uh, for a Muslim. Uh, so I think uh, America has found a very ingenious solution to this problem, which is to allow these experiences to feel completely real, Immersion is so profound that you actually think they are real, but they are not, and therefore they don't turn into dangerous political experiments. Uh, to the point where I think in America you can, um, in certain communities, feel like you are in a theocracy, uh, but you're never really in a theocracy, uh, and the regime is, is able to step back from that and create a kind of generalized virtual reality machinery that allows people to embark uh, on these very deep experiences without ever losing control of the process and being able to switch it off and being able to have a kill switch there. This would be the way I, th I think you said earlier, Dami, that I try to provide a positive spin. Um, and in a way it is that, although it, it is rooted in serious problems about liberalism and its status. But the way to regard what's been happening to America over the past four years in an entirely positive light is to say, well, we have actually a regime here 
that was able to flirt with nationalism, with authoritarianism, uh, with uh, a, an insurrection back in the summer and another insurrection now, and comes out of this as if it's been through a virtual reality uh, experience, which adds to the depth of political and social life, I would say. Now, what is the alternative? You can, you can have Denmark, sure, uh, you don't run these dangers uh, and everything looks very proper, uh, but uh, is the depth of social and political experience the same? Uh, uh, of course, Danish democracy works very well because the inputs are minimal and the questions being decided are really of no major significance to anyone. Uh, Bruno, please, uh, let me just prompt this because I think this will get us to some really good stuff. I mean, you've you've tweeted a lot. I mean, we've gone back and forth on this, on, on actually on Europe and Islam, I think is an interesting contradistinction here that you just sort of brushed up against. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about it. What's, I mean, the European approach to Islam, uh, You've you've made the case that in fact it's 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 anti-Islamic. I mean that that you've said that that uh, that that uh, you know even way before uh, Macron's latest moves about mm -hmm. Islam in France, you've been making the case on on Twitter and in in, in debates we've had about the Balkans and and the rest of this that that uh, Europe is still fundamentally against Islam and there's a kind of I mean uh, a, a real a real resistance and, and even bigotry there. So talk about that and the European approach to sort of politics and reality. That's that specifically on that, and then I'm sure Shadi has plenty to run with there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so it's 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 not the same all over Europe, but clearly it's very particular to France at this moment uh, with Macron. And I think Macron has a civilizational approach to politics, that politics always represents civilizational values, and he regards those values as being essentially the values of the Enlightenment. I don't think they are the values of Christianity uh, with Macron. They are the values of the Enlightenment. And in this context, Islam appears almost as the natural enemy. And I said that, I think, in 2017 to, to great scandal among some of my friends, but I think the facts have borne it out uh, because uh, uh, a few months ago, Macron actually said publicly, and I'm still stunned by that statement, uh, that Islam is everywhere in the world in crisis. Now, I think this points to the problem because it's not up to the political authorities to determine uh, the health of religions. Um, and by the way, uh, it's really quite extraordinary that we're now back in Europe at the point where political authorities think they can do that because the whole experience of liberalism was to tell us you can't and you shouldn't. Uh, so uh, we do have a problem that we haven't been able to solve. Um, there's other forms of liberalism, more tolerant, more open, more diverse, that try to do this. Um, Lots of people think they eventually fail. Uh, Shadi is going to have a lot to say about this. What I try to do in the book is to pursue a different path. Uh, it's not about tolerance and encompassing diversity. You actually build parallel realities uh, and people can inhabit them. Uh, and it's going to feel exactly like the real world. Uh, but we always make sure it isn't the real world because if it was the real world, there would only be space for one. Uh, and we're going to have all these parallel worlds uh, where people can, in a way, almost inhabit a theme park and and but experience life more deeply uh, than perhaps they can in contemporary Europe. So I, I certainly like this idea of Europe being very real and that it's grounded in history in a way that the U.S. isn't. And that's why nation states traditionally are, um, you know, based on traditional conceptions of ethnic of ethnic origin of blood and soil of having um, a particular culture that immigrants have trouble absorbing or buying into um, when they when they come into these countries as we've seen throughout Europe so I think it's an interesting lens through which to look at the um, the so-called Islam problem and that the US because it's you know I'm just kind of thinking through this right now because it's somewhat more fantastical it allows, Muslims to be both fully American uh, and and fully Muslim without having to choose between the two, where in the real world of, say, Germany, um, it's hard to be both fully German and fully um, and fully Muslim. It's hard for anyone to become German um, in general. I mean, if you're a, if you're an American who's lived in Germany for uh, years or decades, you're still going to be seen as an American expat. You'll never be fully accepted as German. And what would that even really mean for an American to become German? Um, but, I, you know, so I, I, I like this, but I, 
I guess where I'm torn a little bit is, so we were talking about Biden, right? And Biden is seeking his own fantasy politics. And we just discussed why that's not necessarily good, because it prevents Americans from looking at systemic causes of inequality, of looking at the structural issues that led to Trump in the first place. So if we see Trump as a symptom um, and not and not just the cause, then Biden presents a problem for us because Biden sees Biden sees Trump as the problem and we remove the problem and then we move on. And that means that in this fantasy world, we're never really addressing the deeper issues that are really, I think, at the center of the malaise that we're seeing in the U.S. today. Um, and and that's what I worry about. And I think you had um, a, a piece perhaps on your Substack, Bruno, or, or, um, that I think you made the point that Biden is trying to achieve pro progressive ideals without really doing the work that if you have a cabinet that has that that is diverse and includes all these different identity groups you can sort of say that you're being very progressive but you're not actually embarking on any deep structural change so it gives the illusion of progress without the substance again that's kind of interesting and maybe it's positive because you know people need illusions to keep them going. It kind of, um, you know, keeps us all uh, under control, if you will. But how long can this dream last if um, you still have, um, I mean, will Americans go along with this progressive illusion or will progressives go with this progressive illusion indefinitely? That's right. So uh, I think that episode of uh, uh, selecting the cabinet uh, was very revealing, I think. Um, Biden clearly was much more interested in providing uh, a cabinet that he could then say, this is what America is, than providing a cabinet of social and economic reformers uh, that would say, this is what America will become. Uh, we have to solve these problems and we have to transform America. Uh, this is important in domestic politics. It's also very important in foreign policy. Uh, and I spend more time looking at that. Uh, so you do have a sort of crumbling American-led order. Uh, the foundations are really disappearing very quickly everywhere. Uh, and now what do you do? Uh, you could try to rebuild it. You could try to build a new kind of order. Uh, I'm just afraid that what Biden is going to do is just to present, to pre pre pretend uh, for the foreseeable future, maybe his whole term, that the order is still in great shape now that Trump has left. Uh, and perhaps even more dangerous uh, in that arena than in the domestic arena, although I think in the domestic arena, it could also become quite dangerous given the divisions and the fractures that exist. Uh, this is particularly important in the case of China, but not only in the case of China. Uh, we'll see what happens, but all, all the people he's selected and all the species so far, they are not uh, attuned to the geopolitical problem, to the processes uh, at the basis, at the foundation of a global order, they already regard that global order as a finished product, uh, as if the only thing that is necessary is for us, uh, and when I say us, I mean uh, the American officials in charge of it, to really believe in it in a way that Trump never did. And if we really believe in it, uh, then it's going to be uh, perfect again. Uh, this is, uh, you know, if you ask me, because you said, Charlie, that... Uh, you were very frightened in, in 2017 and you're very relaxed today. Uh, I'm not going to say that I wasn't worried in 2017, but but I certainly wasn't frightened. I think things have turned out uh, uh, pretty much as I expected. Uh, uh, I don't think it was uh, tragic for America. Um, they know that that may be an uh, unpo unpopular opinion. Uh, and now I think that grounds for, for hope. Certainly policymaking is going to be more rational less insane and that's a good thing but there's still uh, grounds to be really worried uh, if not frightened uh, particularly on the question of world order and how we have essentially an american led order that uh, is, is is crumbling everywhere and there doesn't seem to be much awareness of that in in dc but it could have been but it could have been worse i mean so let's say we're we're going back four years we can imagine a different set of contingencies and chain of events that lead to worse outcomes. This outcome was not foreordained, but I would say that even this outcome 
it turned out to be at least in the last couple months to be pretty bad. I mean, and then maybe we might disagree on this a little bit. And I, I have to say that maybe my critics have pulled me more in their direction right. too much right. and I should maybe resist a little bit more. Hashtag specific. resist. <laughs> Hashtag <laughs> resist. But I mean, I've let myself get a little bit shaken by what I saw um, after after our election, I mean, first of all, the fact that so many Republicans basically refused to accept an electoral outcome, that makes me nervous. I also was not expecting the storming of the Capitol. Um, that caught me by surprise. I think it, any you know people might pretend now the Timothy Snyders and all that, that they saw this coming or whatever, but actually they didn't see this coming. I mean, no one really thought no one was saying, oh, the Capitol is going to be breached and we're going to have loss of life and so on. At least beforehand, I didn't see people saying that. So I think that's pretty bad. I mean, yes, it's not the worst ever outcome imaginable. But again, maybe this is where as an American, it affects my self understanding and myself, the self image right. that I have of, of my country. And that's it's why I'm shaken. Too. Right, it's yes. humiliating too. That's part of it. Uh, well, you know, uh, one could. I, I think part of my of my thesis in the book and elsewhere is that some of these issues have now become undecidable. Uh, whether there was a coup or there wasn't a coup, um, because uh, you know there are no facts uh, to have recourse to. Um, things could have turned out differently. Some of those people storming the Capitol might have found a senator on the way that they didn't like, uh, and, and things could have gotten out of control. So they are kind of undecidable, but still. You know, historians will talk about this. It's still not the case that the insurrectionists uh, uh, appear on the stairs of the Capitol fully armed uh, and that they uh, force their way uh, in by uh, uh, executing a number of policemen. Uh, the whole thing was, uh, to a considerable extent, an accident that was created by the mood that Trump propagated. And I think that's where his responsibility is more than in the particular speech that I listened to and where he doesn't specifically call out for people to storm the, the Capitol. Now, let me point out that I, I actually think that his call to the Georgia Secretary of State was uh, material material for an, for an impeachment uh, process. Uh, so I'm not defending any of this. I'm just saying that it doesn't fit with the historical pattern of a violent and illegal seizure of power. That's not what was happening. What was happening was um, uh, you, you, fantasy politics collapsing uh, in all kinds of, of unpredictable ways. Uh, and I also think that many of the people that are presenting this as a traditional coup, like Fiona Hill, for example, right? I think that that would be a good example. Some uh, of the commentators defending this also need uh, the coup uh, because it's the coup that vindicates the opinion that they've been defending for four years. So they've jumped on this uh, uh, on these events on January 6th and presented in a certain way. But you know, my main point is we're completely captured by this uh, uh, war of 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 script writing of narratives uh, about what really happened, and uh, I very much doubt that we can dig into the facts of the matter. Bruno, you know, let me just. Uh... I I really like to you know you you've now gestured twice at this question of world order and I want to push you on this uh we have a couple more minutes to to dig into this and I think it's really interesting I really look forward to this piece that you you have coming out soon um so in the book, you, you, you also go through sort of 20th century Cold War history uh, with a broad brush. You start talking about Kennedy as, you know, uh, the first sort of moment where a lot of this sort of uh, TV style stuff comes into politics. And then Nixon, I just recently uh, went through the, uh, the chapters in Kissinger's uh, White House years uh, when on the Nixon's trip to China. And it's striking actually even how, how choreographed that is, how much time and effort the Nixon administration did to present that trip to the American TV audience. And it really, as I was reading your book, it really um, reminded me of that. And then you have Reagan, right? And you spend a lot of time about Reagan. Let me ask you this sort of question about world order. Um, did Reagan know what he was doing? Or was it this productive fantasy world that that created in many ways and helped sustain sort of the American order? Did Americans throughout the Cold War know what they're doing? Or was it this like, passive fantasy generation that created the liberal world order that we know and are supposedly still feel it's there. And so let me just even put another point on that question. Um, did Trump understand that the order is falling apart? 
and did his understanding and call it maybe uh, uh, what's the Max Weber term, the um, uh, de-enchantment, disenchantment of the sort of, because that's what Trump is in many ways. It's, he's, he's the great disenchanter in a lot of these sort of myths and, and these, these stories and narratives that America create. I mean, um, Trump was like a big splash of cold water in the face of all the democracy promotion people, of all the liberal world order people. It was a slap in the face, and that's why they hate him so much. But is is... Was Trump onto something as you're gesturing that is the world order falling apart or do we just need do we just need Americans to believe again and maybe just the the act of believing helps generate all the dynamism and energy that's the only way to restructure and rebuild this thing uh, rather than the cold the the splash of cold water that is Trump does that make sense right uh, so you know go, going back a few decades I do think uh, America's secret weapon during the Cold War was precisely this element of fantasy. So that's why I disagree with Timothy Snyder and others that argue that totalitarianism is based on fantasy and liberal democracy is based on truth. That's not how it played out during the Cold War. And certainly uh, all the Soviet ideologues thought they had grasped the truth um, in a Marxist way and that it was playing out in history. Uh, and America won because uh, it was able to move outside uh, these uh, s these given rules. Uh, Trump, uh, you know, Trump didn't do this uh, in any way with any consciousness of it. Um, uh, I've never met him, but but you know, all all impressions are that he doesn't really have an ability to think of these things very coherently, let alone deeply. Uh, but I think uh, he applied some intuitions from the business world, uh, and they ended up uh, providing some new policies. Uh, I think, for example, obviously, he was more aware than even people in think tanks in DC that China had become a peer competitor, which now everyone repeats, but not four years ago. Uh, and he was aware of that, I suspect, because in the world he moved in, he would be trying to buy a building in Abu Dhabi and a Chinese competitor would buy it first. Uh, and so he had a, an awareness that people in think tanks in DC don't have about uh, really uh, how how technologically, economically, financially advanced uh, China has become. Uh, you either live there or go there a lot, uh, or you have that kind of experience that Trump had. So he ended up doing two things that I think are gonna be part of his legacy, even though he had no great awareness of it. First, uh, competition with China and other rivals uh, has to happen outside the liberal international order, because if it happens, uh, within the liberal international order, the United States is going to be tying up its own hands and, and the competitor will not. So then you're open to ideas that um, people before him were not open to, and maybe people after him are not going to be open to, uh, like what he did with Huawei uh, in particular, which, you know, again, a think tank person would regard that as a violation of the liberal order and therefore something we shouldn't do because we are its defenders. That's, I think, the, the legacy number one. Legacy number two, uh, it's this element of balance of power, which again, I don't think anyone in the administration have any understanding of it whatsoever. But because he had, you, you wanted to withdraw American forces from here and there, he ended up creating a certain uh, dynamic of balance of power, particularly in the Middle East, where surprisingly, uh, Turkey, uh, which until uh, he came into power, uh, was uh, aligning more and more with Russia, on an anti-American bloc turned out to be the greatest obstacle and counterweight to Russian power uh, uh, that Russia has had in the past four years. It's not been the European Union, it's not been the United States itself, it's been Turkey everywhere, in Idlib, in Libya, in the Caucasus. Um, and, and that's interesting and I think it's going to remain, uh, there's going to be a long process before strategists in DC realize this, that the United States will have to rely a lot more on balance of power. Uh, and by the way, to some extent, this was actually, there's some awareness of this in, in the administration, I have to say. I said there wasn't, but the paper that just came out a week ago on the Indo-Pacific um, shows some awareness that the United States, rather than imposing its will on Japan and India and Australia, should allow them to grow so that they would become counterweights to China. So I think this is an important idea. Uh, I think and I fear that the Biden administration is going to lose lose it. Uh, it's not going to be interested in it. It's going to be much more interested in American leadership of the old kind. Uh, but it seemed to work pretty well. Uh, I mean, objectively, and both you guys look at this uh, very carefully, 
objectively, the Middle East uh, was a better place uh, during the Trump years than during the Obama years, uh, where, you know, my recollections from 2015 are really traumatic of what was taking place. Shadi? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think the comparison we'd have to make is what would Trump have done if the if the Arab Spring happened under his watch. Um, mm. And I think that, you know, many, many of Obama's instincts would have been repeated in that Obama has always seen the Middle East as a mess and a nuisance and he wanted to be rid of it. I think that if Trump saw, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of protesters and pro-American regimes uh, crushing those peaceful protesters, I think he would have been quite encouraging from my standpoint as a democracy promotion person um, that, you know, wouldn't appeal to me. Um, you know, in some ways, I think the argument could be made that Obama represented the worst of both worlds on the Middle East and that he wasn't he wasn't sufficiently pro-democracy for that approach to be effective, but he wasn't sufficiently pro-dictatorship for that to be effective either. And you end up in this in-between space. I suppose there's a counterfactual where Trump would have been so wholeheartedly behind um, dictators and crushing dissent during the Arab Spring that um, that might have in some ways turned out better. I guess you can, I guess someone can make that argument. I don't, I don't love that argument because of the, my moral objection to it. But, um, but I think, I think Bruno, you're right. You're right that Trump wasn't as bad on the Middle East as I think a lot of people feared. And I remember early on, there were folks saying things like, oh, um, you know, uh, moving the uh, embassy to Jerusalem, this is going to create uh, unprecedented anti-American sentiment and um, the Palestinian and Arab street will be up in arms. Those worst case scenarios didn't end up happening in part because um, that's just not where the center of gravity is in the Middle East anymore. I mean, the Arab street, if we want to use that some somewhat outdated term, just doesn't care enough. I mean, there is still strong pro-Palestinian sentiment throughout the region, and no one should pretend that Arabs are going to get on board with this new kind of um, UAE and Bahrain and maybe Saudi Arabia a kind of uh, thaw with Israel. That said, you know, Arabs have their own internal issues that take precedence, so they're not going to um, uh, to make that into the number one issue. So, and also I think that um, there was a lot, there were a lot of claims that uh, Trump will be a recruiting tool for groups like ISIS and other extremists, that this will be very good for anyone who wants to paint America as an enemy of Muslims and so on. We didn't really see that happening either. I mean, extremists were not able to gain ground during the Trump period. So I think there there does have to be some reassessment of the conventional wisdom. Um, and um, and I, I, I would actually argue, and I, this is where I, I agree, I think that all in all, in, in many ways, Obama, it's not, a, it's not a straight comparison, but Obama was worse on the Middle East in certain ways, but um, that's also because he was dealing with a much more complicated situation because of the Arab Spring. It's an interesting question what Trump would have done about the Syrian civil war. That's and right. on that, he showed mm -hmm. he showed more more of an instinct to pummel the Assad regime. And I see that as the um, the historical um, taint that will always be with the Obama administration. Perhaps Trump would have acted differently on that specifically. Anyway, that's a... Yeah. Well, just just quickly, you know, uh, what, what could have happened uh, with the Syrian civil war is if you had Trump there. Well, part of the problem is that Trump uh, doesn't know anything about this. He just goes by instinct of trying to do the opposite of what Obama did. Uh, and uh, uh, on, on these policies, many times he's still um, doing what the establishment in D.C. and the Pentagon and so on wants to do. Uh, so it's it's difficult to to measure. But certainly if he took his inclinations and to the end and if he was able to pursue them in the case of the syrian civil war what could have happened at the beginning is that uh, america would be much more comfortable with leaving the region to the regional powers 
um, Turkey, UAE in particular, uh, and perhaps since Assad didn't play his cards particularly well, uh, and he had become a target for all of them, uh, perhaps Assad wouldn't have lost it in the way they did. Um, and that might not have been a bad thing. Um, so I, you know, uh, I think the legacy might be in part that we need the development of certain regional orders in the Middle East, uh, also in Asia, uh, in Southeast Asia, and that they are much more effective uh, at providing stability uh, than uh, to have everything be decided from DC. Uh, and uh, and we, we, we had an inkling of that during the Trump years. Now the question is whether it's going to be preserved or it's going to be lost. Uh, but all indications is that um, in the in the Middle East, in particular, on on Turkey, Biden is going to go back to the um, uh, to the old approach that was tried under Obama. Certainly not going to give uh, free reign to Turkey that Turkey had over over the past four years. Is that a good or a bad thing? Um, that quite quite there's disagreement on this actually. Uh, I'm more on the side that it's going to work less well. Bruno, maybe uh, as a as a final question to you. Um... When you when you when you talk about order like this, uh, again, maybe I think that the, the tension between between again the question of re reality uh, intrudes in many ways because the you know in many ways that what you're describing is 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 somewhat a call it a realist foreign policy, uh, and yet you know it's 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 realism is so inimical to the American approach to things, and yet America, kind of like the uh, the. Uh, the the uh, the barbarians that stormed uh, the capital is is constrained by reality sometimes in acting in these things and and these lessons do get learned and it adapts. Are you worried about um, as you see you know Biden trying to sort of do this this dream politic restoration of American order without really internalizing the, the challenges facing America as it as it shapes these things. Are you are you concerned about America's ability to cope with reality and and internalize and sort of adjust to this sort of shifting world? I mean, you, you said just now that you're worried that that the lessons that perhaps could be gleanable from Trump's term won't be learned. But more more fundamentally, as as the the, the very real and concrete challenge of, posed by China comes up, um, are you concerned about our ability to adapt and 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 uh, you know that we make it through this without without catastrophic mistakes? Uh, yeah, I think it'll, it's going to be difficult. We saw in the hearings yesterday, and the new uh, Secretary of State uh, it was interesting. I think his uh, initial speech, uh, he was basically describing everything that has changed in the world, but then he said some things have not changed, and what's not changed is American leadership. And you can see in the speech that it doesn't really take very seriously the list of things that he says have changed. Uh, it's just a way to show that it's not uh, um, lost in the past or anchored in the past. But some things really have dramatically changed. Uh, within probably five to eight years, uh, China is going to have the largest economy in the world. How can you have the same kind of global order when the fundamentals have changed so dramatically? Uh, and so you have to rebuild it. Uh, on, on in, in a different way, on different foundations, where America can still have a role of leadership, but it's going to have to be different. And it's going to have to be a lot more based on balance of power. Now, I think if America was able to transport this love of unreality to foreign policy, it might actually be a good thing. Instead of trying to impose a certain truth, uh, it would be comfortable with different civilizational truths, and you would be trying to keep a balance between them. Uh, because what, what kind of puzzles me, surprises me about the current moment is that in American politics, everything is open for grabs, um, really from the far left to the far right, and no one really takes anything for granted anymore. The consensus is very thin and disappearing. But then when you turn to foreign policy, there's a very thick substratum of values. Uh, there are uh, lecture to the rest of the world. It's become really quite extraordinary, particularly if you look at Mike Pompeo. His whole his whole tenure has been an illustration of this contradiction, uh, where he still, when talking to the rest of the world, adopting the same traditional tropes, uh, the, the 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 sacred role of journalists in protecting a free society, and then in American politics, uh, obviously things don't work like that anymore. Journalists are. Uh, described as a depraved class, uh, and so on and so forth. So clearly, uh, one of two things has to happen. Uh, either America goes back in its domestic politics to the very strong uh, centrist liberal consensus that it projects outwards, 
or its foreign policy is going to become more like its domestic politics, uh, where it's going to be uh, much more open to different paths and different ways to organize society. It might not be a bad thing. Um, and I think it's a kind of an ironic America that uh, doesn't take things uh, too seriously. It might be a more constructive America because right now what we have is a number of powers that actually take its their civilizational uh, evangelical role very seriously, starting with China. Uh, and what the approach here is, do you fight China's evangelical approach, uh, which, you know, I've written in my book on the Belt and Road, uh, and it's very striking. Many people still don't think that China has this approach of converting the whole world to its values, but it does. And it's openly said, more often in Mandarin than in English. How do you fight this uh, Chinese evangelical approach if there's a contradiction, China and evangelical? How do you do this? Do you fight it with your own evangelical approach? Or do you fight it with a more ironic approach where the concern is to limit Chinese power, not to convert China to your model? Uh, and here too, I think Trump had a certain intuition that the priority should be to limit, contain Chinese power, to weaken China where necessary since it's risen so fast, uh, not to destroy it, but to weaken it or to slow down its, its growth. I know my Chinese friends get mad when I say this, but what's the problem with that? If you grow too fast, it's destabilizing for others. Uh, and if someone else has to slow your growth path, that's fine for everyone, perhaps even for you. So this should be the approach, which he tried to do in a very clumsy way, and not the approach of trying to change China. So I'd like to have a real detailed account of what happened in the Oval Office in those discussions. But there were people in the administration, uh, Mnuchin and others, that were trying to convert China to a Western model of capitalism. And I think Trump's approach was just, uh, you know, they, they, they need to get a punch in the nose. Uh, uh, and that's all, not more sophisticated than that. Um, so there's that, there's a, I, you know, to conclude, I think we're probably, you want to tell me we're running out of time. Well, uh, no, not at all. No, I mean, I, we can keep going. I, this is, this is terrific. Right. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's up to you if we've got more time. Yeah. Go on, Bruno, finish your thought. No, so just the, the finishing the thought that, yeah, you know, I think the, the current moment, I, and I think the last two minutes where I got quite excited about this, uh, um, I was trying to make the point that there's a great openness to different uh, paths of future development. Very exciting moment. Uh, but that's also why I don't take seriously the idea that we're now going to go back to a placid, uh, quiet, uh, traditional way of doing politics with Biden, which is what everyone on Twitter today is celebrating and uh, applauding and, and being completely sure that that's what's going to happen. But I, I really doubt it. And maybe this is um, you know a good place to say that it's just been so refreshing to hear what I think that I can describe as an overturning of the conventional wisdom, because I've been struck certainly today and in leading up to the inauguration. Um, and I've, I think that even I've been somewhat affected by this. It just incentive structures aren't really aligned towards questioning the, the sort of this new conformity, this, this new sense of turning the page that because we're so relieved that Trump is leaving the scene and that there's this sense of returning to normalcy, I think it's very easy to fall back into old patterns of thinking. And Bruno, you obviously don't really have much time for that. And that's why it's so good to kind of hear you systematically dismantle a lot of this stuff. And I think that what we're going to see in the coming months and perhaps even years on the, on the, on the center, the center left is a real push towards conventional wisdom. Now, that was the case under Trump as well, but at least at least there the dynamics were a little bit different. I think now there's going to be more pressure, um, but I could be wrong. Who knows? I mean, I think one thing that I certainly got out of your book is that you know, it's very hard to predict politics and, um, you know, there's a lot of variables that we can't really account for. But I guess maybe, you know, as we close up here, um, what do you when you when you're on Twitter, you obviously don't seem to care about people attacking you. And maybe because you're not as much part of the American scene, people people aren't trying to get you in line. I'm I'm an American who is a member of the center left slash left so people see me as a threat when i go outside what the traditional ideas are because they're like shady hey you're a brown person too get in line why are you kind of 
offering these contrarian thoughts, save that for after the election. But even after the election, they're probably not going to be okay with it. So maybe that's part of it. But how do you sort of deal with all this bullshit in terms of the mainstream conversation? Right. It's um, it, it's a bit tough, but you, you end up paying a certain cost. Um, well, you know, you don't get some invitations, but you get others. Um, uh, now you don't get any invitations at all because no one travels. Uh, so that's uh, even easier. Uh, no, you know, I'm, um, uh, I, you know, I hope it's not going to sound modest, but, you know, I'm really trying to understand these things uh, uh, and, and getting upset when I don't. Uh, and that's really what's motivating me. Uh, I use Twitter to test ideas. I think I've come to conclude that's maybe not doesn't work very well because uh, <laughs> people do do take it literally. But that that's what's happening there. But you you, you do that a lot, uh, both of you, and that that's why I like to follow you there. But I I do think it's true that um, perhaps it was always like this. I don't know, but the envir the intellectual environment has become very constricting, um, very difficult, uh, and I'm not sure that the fact that everything has become so public. You know, there are things you could say at midnight in a hotel lobby over over a drink, uh, but if these discussions are happening on Twitter, you uh, it, it's different. It's going to have a different kind of impact, um, and so it's disappointing because uh, uh, there's an enormous pressure to to conform to what uh, people not to what is the conventional wisdom because it's a bit more dynamic than that to what people think is the, anticipate the conventional wisdom to be. And so it becomes a bit of a stock market where everyone is betting on the stock that is going to rise. But, you know, because everyone is betting on that very quickly, in fact, you have a process by which a new conventional wisdom is formed. Um, so, it, and it's very quick. Uh, something happens and within a few hours, there's already the right and the wrong way to think about something. It's quite disturbing, I, I have to say. Uh, and it's made intellectual life much more difficult. Bruno, uh, again, I thought this was absolutely terrific. Thanks so much. Uh, and honestly, I think for for uh, for my money, for the next time uh, you join us, first, I hope it'll be in person um, mm -hmm. here in my living room. Um, and uh, uh, and second, I think you know one of the, the the fascinating things we only slightly touched on is is the question of China, which I think you, you've written so many interesting things about. And it's going to be. I think one of the, the 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 real telling questions of how this uh, the next four years works out and how how the Biden administration deals with that. So I really look forward to to continuing the conversation next time. Yeah, and and by Bruno's book, history has begun. Um, follow mm -hmm. him on his Substack, and um, you know maybe it doesn't matter. I was going to ask Bruno where he literally is in the physical world, but we have learned that. Does that even matter? Um, he creates his own reality. We create our own reality on the wisdom of crowds, and that's why you guys listen to us. <laughs> so thank you, Bruno. Thanks, Bruno. Oh, it's been a, it's been a great pleasure. Um, you know, let's hope uh, things are better in the summer and we can meet in person. Uh, I really look forward to that. Yeah, I would love that. Oh, well, maybe you can tell us where you actually are right now. <laughs> well, you know, before the pandemic, I used to be uh, traveling nonstop a week in different places, uh, and I miss that more than anything else. It's been very difficult in that sense. Uh, but now I'm, I'm in Portugal. I, I have a house here, and uh, 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 until it's possible, not just to travel, because I guess it's literally possible to travel, but it's not possible to travel the way we like to travel. Yeah. Uh, freely and, and, and exploring everything, and, you know, taking a bus, uh, a congested bus in, the, in Pakistan and all those things, uh, and the borders have become very difficult. So, you know, hopefully... Yeah. This will be solved soon indeed. before yep. we all go insane. Indeed, indeed. That's right. Okay. Right. Thanks, Bruno. Thanks, Have Bruno. Okay. Yeah. Talk to you bye later. Bye-bye.